Welcome to our final installment of the Spring UT Energy Symposium. The next talk, I typically announce the next talk, but we are not going to have one this semester. Next we'll meet is the first week of fall semester. It's a real special treat to introduce to you a very special person, a very important person, a visionary man in the world of technology and energy, Arnold Grubler, who is a senior research scholar and the acting program director at the Institute, International Institute for Applied Systems and Analysis, or IASA as we know popularly. He is also a professor of energy and technology at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where he teaches every fall for the last 13 years, Arnold? 12 years, yeah. Yeah. And Arnold, you know, many of you just heard, he said, keep it uh, short and sweet. It's very hard to keep his introduction short and sweet. Actually, it was four pages. I had to really cut it down. But I definitely, I will not listen to him. I want to highlight a few things for sure. So, you know, his teaching and research is very visionary, and it focuses on the long-term history and note and the future of technology and environment with an emphasis on energy communications and, and technology. His writings are very, very influential. I use them very frequently in my own classes, but uh, there is hardly a forum I have been to uh, that talks about innovation, infrastructure, long-term implications that does not involve in Arnold's uh, writing in some, some fashion or the other. Uh, he received his master's degree and PhD degree from Technical University of Vienna. Uh, he has been the serving, lead, he has served as the lead author and contributing author for the second, third, fourth, and fifth assessments of the IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, he is going to, he has been a co-editor, co-author, or an author of over 12 books, over 100 publications, uh, and several other reports. He is going to talk to us about a very special and very different kind of uh, visionary study that uh, he has contributed significantly called the Global Energy Assessment, and we really look forward to hearing from you, Arnold. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you very much, Barum. I think you have overdone it, but, uh, you know, uh, every salesperson obviously uh, embellishes uh, uh, the product. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming and listening to a slightly different take on the energy system. We will look today at the energy system from the lens of where actually the dominant form of energy use is happening, and that's happening actually in urban environments. So the traditional idea that energy systems are basically not relevant from a geographical context is actually not true, because the dominant spatial manifestation of the energy system is actually happening in urban environments. And interestingly enough, this problematic has historically escaped largely the attention of the scientific community. When we started this global energy assessment, okay, this is, we refer to it as the IPCC of energy, so a multi-year, multi-stakeholder assessment of all energy issues. Uh, I was particularly pleased that it is the first assessment ever where the topic of urbanization was addressed. It's not addressed in previous IPCC reports. There's now, in the latest one, there's a chapter on human settlements, strongly influenced by this work was not in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment or any other scientific assessment. So this Global Energy Assessment was the first where really the topic of urbanization uh, was raised and I had the privilege to coordinate this chapter with many, many distinguished authors. I'll show them later on. The material of this assessment is available, free on online, PDF files, the whole report is available online and we also have made a derivative book published by Earthscan, very cheap, the paperback uh, version, which has more material than we could fit into the page limitations of the five kilogram, 1,800 page Global Energy Assessment Report. So, purpose today is simply to preview or give you a quick overview of what we did find out uh, when looking at this novel lens of the energy system from an urban perspective. So I have regrouped it into clusters of major conclusion and we start with the first two ones whatever is urban needs to have obviously an equivalent which is non-urban so let's start quickly with an urban and rural kind of dichotomy when we look 
at the global energy system, it's actually, according to our assessment, the world is already today predominantly urban. Most of you will be familiar with the United Nations statistics where we have passed two or three years ago the 50% threshold. More than 50% of the world population lives in cities, so that's a widely cited number and most of you are familiar with. But that's one demographic perspective, but we need to look at other perspectives as well. And from these other perspectives, actually the world is already much more urban than the demographic perspective suggests. The world is also growing demographically, economically, and energy-wise, and most of this growth will happen in urban environments. So, another interesting take. And the corollary of that is that that growth in rural areas will actually be much more limited. When you look at the demographic projections, actually it's quite likely that rural populations globally will peak around the year 2020, so that's just around the corner, at a level of approximately 3.5 billion people and will decline thereafter. So rural populations are shrinking and all of the demographic momentum and growth will be in urban environments. So this is a kind of overview using different kind of indicators to suggest the multiple dimensions of the urban phenomenon. Uh, what we have tried to assess, data is very sparse. You know, we focus our data reporting on the nation state and the nation state very often is not the interest, most interesting uh, entity for reporting. When you look at numbers like GDP, the gross national product, we all collect faithfully GDP statistics even for the smallest countries, but we hardly have GDP statistics for cities. And yet these cities are economic powerhouses. The GDP of the metropolitan area of Tokyo is larger than the GDP of the United Kingdom. So a single city generates more GDP than an entire nation state. And this just gives us an idea of how important cities are. The least important dimension is actually the spatial dimension because of density. Between 0 0.2 to 2.7% of the surface area of the globe are covered by cities. And as we have said, more than 50% now live already in cities. The year 2000 is the common base here for this estimation, so that was 47% there. Our estimate is that 81% of the world GDP is produced and consumed in cities, and three quarters of final energy is used in cities. So 50% of the world population, but 80% of the world GDP, and three quarters of the world energy use, final energy use, is actually in cities. We can look at other indicators like light luminosity when we measure with satellites nighttime lights or when we look at our technological infrastructures I give you here the density of internet routers. This is perhaps the most interesting one. The infrastructure which we have invented to kill space is actually spatially most explicit. 96% of all internet routers are actually in urban areas which is quite surprising but that just shows the enormous agglomeration externalities and network effects of a knowledge economy as it is dominated by cities. A second important aspect I have already mentioned earlier is to look at this kind of distribution, cities versus rural areas, and also within different categories of cities. So this gives you historical data since 1950 and the central projections from the United Nations to the year 2050. In terms of where is the population living? So we see here the rural population, and as mentioned earlier, we are here, and the peak of rural population is imminent, estimated by the UN to occur by the year 2020, and afterwards the rural population will decline. All of the rest of the growth is urban. Now, an important finding from this UN studies, and also from other studies, is that the urban growth phenomenon is heterogeneous. It means not all cities grow alike. And in our fascination with what we call megacities, so cities are 10 million inhabitants or more, we tend to forget that megacities are actually population or otherwise not the most important carriers of the urbanization phenomenon. The most important carriers of the urbanization phenomenon are actually small and medium-sized cities. And these constitute a significant challenge to which we will return later on. 
the financial and the institutional resources of the small cities, particularly in developing countries, are very weak. And so therefore, they have a hard time to address the energy and sustainability challenges of urban growth. I'm not worried about Tokyo. I'm not worried about New York City. I'm not worried about Paris. I might even not be worried about Austin in Texas, but I worry about the city of 100,000 inhabitants in sub-Saharan Africa. We have no data and the institutional capacity is very weak. And yet, it is these small scale cities in the developing countries that will see the largest momentum of demographic, economic, and energy growth in the future. And we have no idea how to address this. So already a significant finding. Mega cities are great, they're fascinating, but they're not the biggest dynamic item in the system. It is actually the myriad of small, anonymous, not noticed, small scale cities, particularly in developing countries. Let me now move to the second cluster of conclusions. First important cluster of conclusion deals with the energy implications of cities. Now, I teach in an environmental school, so you will forgive me if I start with an environmental statement. Cities are good for the environment. The worst thing that can happen to the environment are suburbs and exurbs. Cities are great for the environment because of concentration and agglomeration externalities. They produce a lot of services, high value goods, and because of density and also agglomeration externalities, they do this very, very, or relatively resource efficient. We all know efficiency is the endless frontier, but cities are much more efficient than rural or suburban hinterlands. And as a result, city dwellers often have lower direct energy and carbon footprints. But this conclusion needs to be moderated or tempered by the complexities of understanding inherently open systems, which are cities, and so therefore we have important methodological and above all data challenges to account for actually urban energy use. I'll come to that in a second. So, this is what we have found out in the assessment, being very unhappy with the existing uh, available data sets, we have developed our own data set. So this is a data set of approximately 250 cities for which we could get actually data on. You know, this is all unpaid, so this is a voluntary activity like IPCC, so that's what we had, uh, could come up with. And what you see here is now a sample of cities in Annex 1 countries, so these are OECD countries. This is a sample that comprises 132 cities, and you have here the cumulative population. So we cover approximately close to 200 million people in this sample. And on the y-axis, you have the per capita energy use. And you see pretty some dispersion, okay, from 200 uh, gigajoules per capita all the way down to 25. Big dispersion, cities are different, we all understand that. People are different, and per capita energy use of people are, is therefore different. What is more significant is the color code. Each time you see the color red, it means the city, that particular city, has a per capita energy use which is higher than the national average of the country in which the city is located. Each time a bar is marked as blue, it means that city has a per capita energy use which is significantly below the national average. And as you can see here, the dominant color scheme of the OECD cities is blue. That means most of the cities have actually lower energy footprints per capita than the non-cities or the national average, which means, which supports my statement, that cities are good for the environment, provided the cities are in OECD countries. This is our sample for developing countries, non-annex one countries, so the sample size is much smaller, 68 cities and the population size is higher, close to 300 million people, so these cities are much larger. And we again show the per capita energy use. So two important conclusions. When you look here at the absolute numbers, these numbers are not dissimilar to the numbers of industrialized countries. So many cities in developing countries have actually energy use or carbon emissions which are very similar to cities in OECD countries. So there is no rationale to actually argue 
that these cities should be excluded from global carbon mitigation and control efforts. They are not different. They are rich and they consume resources and produce emissions not dissimilar from many cities in the OECD countries. Second conclusion is that the dominant color code for developing countries is red. That means in the cities of the developing countries, per capita energy use and per capita CO2 emissions is significantly above the national average. Why is this the case? Well, cities in developing countries are extremely inequitable. That means cities concentrate wealth. And the urban rural income gradient in developing countries is particularly pronounced in many countries urban incomes are between a factor of three to five higher than rural incomes. In a typical OECD countries, the rural urban income gradient is to the tune of 30% only. So that means cities are economic powerhouses in the developing world, and because they concentrate so much wealth, the res resulting resource consumption, energy use, CO2 emissions is much larger. Yes? This is the same y-axis, yes. And how did you distinguish city from suburb in each of these? This is a very intricate issue, uh, and we cannot distinguish with a strict methodological framework. Of course, we can formulate that, but we do not have the data. So this is basically city as defined in the statistical source in which, uh, which reports it. So these are normally distinct cities delineated by political boundaries, not by functional boundaries like commuter sheds, metropolitan areas, or something like that. Most of the data which are available are actually at the level of individual political entities, a politically governed city. So this is a restrictive boundary, but we have used here simply the information that was available. So, from the perspective of a global assessment, clearly, as the countries could be very, very, very large and invites, of course, uh, considerations of how to manage this urban growth in the developing world. What I have shown up to now is a very simple engineering concept of energy use, which simply look at energy flows that are consumed in the city in form of energy. That's the most simple uh, delineation and we refer to it, this is the direct energy use. But of course we consume energy not only in direct form, we consume energy also in indirect form. Energy is embodied in the goods and services which we consume in a city and which are not necessarily produced in a city. So therefore are imported. This is often referred to as gray energy or embodied energy in the literature. Now as cities are inherently open systems, actually these trade interdependencies become very, very important. The sobering conclusion is that we can do a careful systems assessment of direct and indirect, of domestic versus imported versus exported resource flows for less than a dozen of cities, and they're all megacities. We just don't have the data simply because this requires very sophisticated accounting models you know, multi-regional input-output table linked with international input-output tables. It's very complicated and we have only a few cities for which we have the data. But in all of these cities, basically, you have here Tokyo, Beijing and Shanghai, three cities in the rapidly expanding Asian region where we have quantifications in terms of the direct energy use versus the embodied energy use. And you see how important trade is. Now this is one perspective when we look at embodied energy use and usually in studies of environmental or carbon footprints of cities this is very often uh, evoked as a perspective. This is referred to as consumption accounting. You take the GDP of the people and you multiply it with some kind of estimated specific emission factor of this dollar of GDP irrespectively of where the emissions actually has happened, whether it's in the city or somewhere else. But even that perspective is too short because it ignores that the city itself is an exporting commodity. 
So that means we not only must look at how much energy is used in the city, how much energy is imported into the city in direct energy form or embodied energy form. We also need to look up how much energy and CO2 emissions are actually re-exported from the city. To give you an example, the most extreme case of a city, of an open economy city which, for which we have data, is the city state of Singapore. That's why we have data. And in Singapore, this trade component in the carbon footprint of Singapore is six times as large as the direct, usually consumption-based accounting uh, footprint, what we have in the UNFCCC or in the IPCC methodology. So a factor of six difference if you take into account all of the multiple trade flows, imports of crude oil, re-export of refined gasoline to another country, and then re-import of part of that refined gasoline in the form of plastics or manufactured goods again into the city, and then again re-export of that. So it's very, very complicated, and we have important data and methodological deficits. This needs to be addressed. It is currently not addressed, but I leave it as an important research challenge to the younger colleagues in this audience. Now, let me move to the next cluster of important conclusions, not very, very, very uh, novel. Cities are very unique and specific, and so therefore cities have specific sustainability challenges, but they also have specific opportunities. And all of these challenges and opportunities revolve around a, a comparable kind of concept, and that's related to density. Not necessarily population density. We can talk about energy density. We can talk about GDP density. But density is an important characteristic of urban environments. And densities have unique opportunities. If you look for a job, you better look for a job in an area where many jobs are posted. There is a high density of job openings. Okay, We understand that. And if we worry about the environment, high density, of course, means even relatively clean options could be actually too polluting for an urban environment because even clean, if the density is sufficiently high enough, might not be enough. i show you here now something different. Uh, many of you will have heard about rank size distributions. If you ever, ever have read something about urbanization and cities, scaling laws is a very much discussed topic in urban environments. And the classical rank size distribution, first formulated by Zipf, professor in Harvard in 1949, basically established a very regular relationship between the rank, so this is whether you're number one, number two, number three, or number 100 in a hierarchical system, and an indicator of size. Originally, this is population. In this rank size distribution, we show the energy use. Now, the important thing to realize is that contrary to some work of some colleagues from complexity science, which is very popular in the literature, and as this is taped and posted on the web, I won't mention these names in these critical remarks, these kind of scaling laws are, contrary to popular perception, not uniform. They're not uniform out of a very simple reason, because this is a global system. Cities are global. And so therefore it's insufficient to look only at the urbanization or the city hierarchies in a national context, which most of the scaling analysis do. This is a global curve, and you see that there is no global uniform distribution curve. If all the cities would perform to the same scaling or power law, we would see here a straight line. And we're familiar with this straight line from the ZIPF distribution or the classical rank size distributions. In terms of energy, we see actually three different regimes. And the three different regimes are shown here by the straight lines. You can see this, okay, this is a regression line, or the economists might interpret this sim simply as a gross elasticity. So that means as the city moves up in the rank, it means as a city grows in importance, it gets bigger and bigger, what's the elasticity of that growth with respect to energy use? And you see here for the small cities, the elasticity is a factor of six for each unit of growth of the city. For the medium-sized cities, the green line here, this elasticity is a factor of 1.6. And for the large cities here, the elasticity is 0.46. So that means very large cities, when they grow, do not grow proportionally in the energy use. 
that means large city growth is again good for the environment, but small city growth has very strong implications up to an elasticity of a factor of six for energy growth. Combine this with the previous conclusion about the dominance of small and medium scale cities in the developing world as a main carrier of the urbanization phenomenon and you have here a very daunting scenario of demand increases of energy use in developing country cities. But the distribution curve is not uniform and the scaling pattern needs to be disaggregated by city size classes or other appropriate functional differentiations and not by political geographical boundary of nation states as is traditionally done in scaling analysis. This density phenomenon which has its influence obviously on the previously discussed rank size distribution has a significant environmental implications. I show you here a three-dimensional map of China. So we have here the big coastal cities, you know, Shanghai, etc., Hong Kong, Beijing here. And we use a simple measure of looking at the potential consequence of pollution, borrowed from our colleagues from the nuclear field, where the idea of exposure is a very simple but very powerful one. Now exposure means simply, okay, level of radiation times the time you are exposed to that level of radiation gives you an indication about the health impact of your exposure to that radiation. And we use the same concept here by looking at a traditional indicator of urban air pollution, which are sulfur dioxide emissions. And what you see here are enormous spikes. Spikes, which are the twin result or the, of the product of very high emission levels multiplied by high concentrations of people. So the urban air is foul, is polluted, and a lot of people suffer from it, and therefore we have huge health impacts. It's less of a problem if you have a polluted environment and nobody lives in it from a human health perspective. Now, this is a repeated phenomenon and because we have this enormous concentration of people from an exposure perspective we can actually calculate backwards what would be tolerable emission levels and the answer is very simple the tolerable emission level is zero the density is so high that even acceptable WHO air pollution guidelines produce still unacceptably high exposure because the dose response relationship to air pollution is highly nonlinear as we have seen from the recent burden of the global burden of disease study. Which means if you take this concept of density, which is a fundamental concept in cities seriously, we need to conclude that the first implication of high density for the energy sector is that the energy system needs to become zero emission. Not clean, not low emission zero emission, which means in an urban environment that we have ultimately only two energy carriers left, which is the electron and the hydrogen atom. Everything else won't do in the long run. So perhaps, indeed, cities are the first node of a future transition to a novel energy system simply because a novel energy system is required to produce zero emissions and not low emissions, which is an important concept, I think, to communicate to decision makers. It wouldn't be the answer if we would not use uh, systems analytical concepts like exergy analysis. Sorry for those of you who think that this is a misspelling. Exergy, okay, is a very popular concept with people working in thermodynamics and in energy systems. And basically, exergy is interesting from an, an analytical perspective because it gives you an idea of what you can achieve thermodynamically. If you calculate efficiencies with the first law efficiency, basically you, you take as maximum 100%, but this is of course unrealistic. There is no thermodynamic conversion process that can achieve 100%. And in exergy analysis, the efficiency which you calculate is always based on what is thermodynamically maximum possible. So 10% is not 10% in absolute amounts, but 10% of what is absolutely possible. So if the thermodynamic frontier is 70% efficiency, then your 10% is 7%. Okay, so that's the essence of exergy analysis. 
I show you here an exergy balance for Vienna. We've done three exergy balances, okay, for a Swedish city, for a city of London, and for Vienna, and we had a hard time in doing it. It's quite complicated. You need a lot of data. But lo and behold, the important conclusion is as follows. When we look in just from a traditional energy efficiency perspective, the city of Vienna, its energy system has a 50% efficiency in going from secondary energy to useful energy. This is very, very high. And the reason for that is that Vienna is a very well-managed and engineered and governed city. So we have a lot of cogeneration, district cooling systems, you know, a lot of fancy stuff that helps to improve the efficiency of the system. So 50% between secondary energy and useful energy, which sounds pretty high and suggests there's not much room to improve anymore. Nothing could be further away from the truth. When we do an exergy analysis of the city of Vienna, we find that the exergetic efficiency of the system is only 17%. So we achieve only 17% of what is thermodynamically possible. So the efficiency frontier is very far out, and the efficiency potential is exceedingly large, and the traditional first law efficiency analysis cannot do this. I show you here the data for a couple of other cities for which we actually could assemble the data. Again, this would be a great project for a bright student uh, in an engineering department to look at a U.S. city, because up to now we do not have any uh, U.S. cities for which exergy analysis have been performed, but it might be a very valuable kind of exercise. The numbers are different. Obviously, cities are different. Energy systems in different cities are different. But the major conclusion still holds. Energy systems in an urban context are exceedingly wide away from the efficiency frontier. So in theory, thermodynamically, we can produce as much with one-fifth of the energy or we can produce five times as much with the same energy. From a thermodynamic perspective, this is not economics, we're not talking about costs here, just simply from a thermodynamic perspective. And how much more efficient a city is compared to traditional rural environments, I show you here, this is a very classical study of an exergy analysis of a rural village in Mexico, and you see that the exergetic efficiency of a traditional biomass, biomass-based economy is a lousy 5% compared to 15 to 20 percent in a modern industrialized city. So regressing to the pre-industrial age has a significant efficiency penalty of a factor of three to four, and we need to think about it. Again, you know, people like to be critical about cities and urban environments, but this perspective or this historical perspective gives an idea that there are good reasons why we have moved into cities. And one of the reasons is that cities allow us to engineer systems much more optimally and much more efficiently. So we get much more bang for the buck, to use an American term. Last conclusion, and this is perhaps a little bit more complex or perhaps even frustrating for some, is that we have enormous improvement possibilities. So we can re-engineer the system as engineers, as policy makers, as analysts, as citizens, of enormous possibilities for improvement, but most require management at this systemic level. So not tinkering with individual measures, but with systems. And these systems are in urban form, the interrelationship between density, land use, transportation systems, etc., or within the systemic aspect of the energy system when we talk about integration of more intermittent renewables, for instance, and above all when we talk about energy cascading or recycling in the form of district heat or district cooling system. But at the same time, we have what we have called in this assessment a par government paradox that the largest improvement potentials of this system are when we change systems and not individual components when change entire systems. But systemic change is very, very difficult to achieve at the urban scale because we have an extremely fragmented and dispersed decision-making structure. And so therefore, what we can influence the most is to be influenced 
most difficultly. So it is most difficult to influence what matters the most. I show you this representation in a kind of stylized hierarchy. Obviously, this is a generalization. They always, we always can argue in a particular city whether measure five is measure five or perhaps it's measure six or measure four. But lo and behold, in the grand scheme of an abstraction across many, many cities, we have here two hierarchies. A hierarchy of decreasing order of importance. So we will go from one to seven. So that means when we look at the energy use or carbon footprint, that matters the most and that matters the least. And what we can influence with urban scale decision making by urban people, by urban governments, by firms operating in an urban environment, actually follows the inverse gradient. So at the top, we have the two big ticket item, the international division of labor, trade. Are you a manufacturing city? Are you a global city? Cities like New York or London, one third of the energy use of the cities is international transport in form of shipping or airport fuels. Not recorded in the statistic. This is international, so it's not recorded in, even not, not in national statistics, but from a systemic perspective, New York without the airport and ports would not be New York. It could not be a global city. And that's about one third of the energy use of the city of New York. Second, of course, is income and consumption. Now, this cannot be influenced by the urban scale decision-making processes. But at the same time, it is the area that matters most in explaining differences in energy or carbon footprints across different kinds of cities. And at the bottom, we have what matters least. And this is what many of my environmental friends do not like to hear, urban renewables. According to our assessment, locally generated renewables can at best provide 1% of the energy use of a big city. 1%. Reason is very, very simple. The demand density is so high that the demand density is several fold larger than even the largest renewable energy flow available in a city, which is sunlight. Okay? Forget about biomass in an urban context. Okay? And you have space limitations. Okay? So even if you were to use all of the area of London plastered with PV panels, no more space available for anything else, you could at maximum provide 15% at maximum of the energy use of London. Obviously, we need to scale this number to some realistic numbers. We need areas for housing. We need areas for parks. We need areas for infrastructure. And when we actually look at the available areas, maximum 1%, according to our assessment. But that's a very popular and easy measure of for urban scale decision making. Any urban dweller, if you have a house here in Austin, you can put a PV panel on it. Easy to do. But in the grand scheme of things, it will not matter very much. So if you want to have renewables in urban areas, these renewables have to be produced somewhere in the hinterland. So the renewable energy system of the future will not be very, very different from the energy system which we have formed for fossil fuels. Concentrated production somewhere else, massive infrastructures to bring the energy flows into the urban environments and then use of this energy in the urban environments. We've done this for fossil fuels and we will need to do it for renewables as well if you we want to have more renewables. But locally harvested renewables is just a very, very insignificant option. So we need to maneuver between these two hierarchies. What we can influence most matters the least and what matters the most we can influence the least and as usual in this kind of dichotomies, we should focus on the middle ground, on the mesoscale. There, there we have a good match, what we can influence through policies, through investments, through entrepreneurship, through innovation. And what matters a lot actually for urban energy and CO2. And here we have these two big ticket items in the middle. This is the efficiency of energy end use how efficiently we use energy in buildings, in processes, in vehicles, and in appliances. Now, this is traditionally regulated through national standards, but there are also already interesting attempts to have 
local standards, technology standards, or other voluntary schemes to influence efficiency. And then there's the big ticket item of urban forum, which is basically the interaction between density, public transport, car ownership, and the functional mix in a city. So this is all lumped together, and this urban forum component or of interrelated aspects is a dominant source to uh, explain differences in energy use and is obviously an important policy option which we can harness if we want to minimize energy use or CO2 emissions. And then we have smaller ticket items which are fuel substitutions through import or energy systems integration through cogeneration or heat cascading. Now this is all very abstract, so I show you some simulations. And I mention these simulations because uh, uh, for those of you who have an interest in energy models, I think the Sin City model, it's a model developed at Imperial College in London, is a new type of model which I think is very characteristic of very exciting and new developments which many of you will embrace in your future academic careers, what I call hybrid models. So it's a combination of a classical engineering type of system optimization model with a spatially explicit model and an agent-based approach of agent interaction. So we have three different methodological paradigms all integrated into one model. And through that, we actually can really give justice to the enormous complexity of urban systems. This model right now simulates the evolution of a synthetic city, and so therefore it's called Sin City, with a maximum population size of 20,000 people. We cannot go bigger. We are not in Santa Fe where we have access to supercomputers in Los Alamos, okay? So this is not Albuquerque yet, okay? But it, clearly this is something more long-term in the future. Perhaps in 10, 20 years our computing power will be sufficiently cheap and large scale that we actually could start simulating reasonably scale cities. So for the time being, only a hypothetical city at the level of 20,000 people. And the model does very good what models generally do very good. They allow experiments on the computer. You know, we don't want to do policy experiments with real cities and then find out that we make mistakes. It's much cheaper to do the mistake on a computer simulated city. And so we have done a lot of simulations to assess what matters the most if you want to influence the energy use of a city. We have here three large categories, conversion losses, so that's the energy which is used by the energy system itself, the buildings, and then the transport. We do not model here manufacturing in greater detail. And then we say, what happens if we only focus on energy efficiency? Well, we can reduce by a factor of two. What happens if we only focus on compact cities? We only work on urban form? Nah. Okay, also a factor of two. And this is a system, overall systems optimization, and this is the theoretical minimum. So this gives you an idea which kind of policy measures or groups of policy measures to influence the urban energy and carbon footprint is the most important. And also these simulations confirm our previous kind of hierarchy that actually the most powerful leverage is at this mesoscale level when you influence the efficiency of our artifacts and if you improve the efficiency of the urban form that primarily works via transportation energy as influence on the energy system. But urban form goes beyond energy because it's also an important characteristic of diversity and it's also an important characteristic of quality of life in an urban environment. So therefore, there are other good reasons and not only energy optimization reasons to be worried about urban form. And obviously, if you pull all leverages together, you can optimize even better and do better. So that's also a reassuring conclusion from these model simulations. And if we do a very, very good job in the energy sector, okay, if we have, for instance, a completely distributed energy system, if we produce the energy exactly where it is needed, we don't need transportation, and we don't have transportation losses or conversion losses, we can get rid of this blue item here, 
the energy conversion losses, but this is still comparatively smaller than the efficiency gains which we can gain by improving the efficiency of energy use per se. So the energy engineer is important. He can help in the optimization, but the sociologist and the economist that worries about the energy use of people, of institutions, or of, or of technologies is, of course, far more important than the energy engineer. Both of them are needed, but in terms of the energy footprint of cities, it is actually the end use component of the system that is the dominant driver, and it is not the supply side of the system which is the dominant driver. It's frequently forgotten in the discourse, unfortunately, so that's why I mention it here. So, this is the end of my talk. I recap all of the major conclusions. I will not repeat them because I have spoken already much too much time, but I would like to end by showing in the last slide the list of distinguished co-authors that have contributed to this, so this is not only my doing. I had the privilege of coordination, but obviously the work was done by a large group of people, and I'm particularly grateful to all of them because, as mentioned, this was all free labor and unpaid, and it took a lot of work to produce this kind of assessment. Uh, most of the stuff is online, so I invite you to visit this material in greater detail. There's also supporting material in form of uh, working papers, and we also have posted the city energy database, which I have shown you also online. So there is food for thought and bones to chew for, an, uh, for the analytically interested uh, in working on urban energy issues. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>